Hello everyone. Uh, this is Sheldon Ding and this is Keith. And today uh, we are very happy to uh, present this uh, securing the perimeter with the CFCR and CFAR and plus CICD pipelines. So CFCR is a container, uh, is a Cloud Foundry container runtime. Basically, this is a, a, a Cloud Foundry container runtime is a distribution of Kubernetes, and CFAR is a Cloud Foundry application runtime. Uh, which is based on like open source distribution of Cloud Foundry. And, um, you know, Keith and I, we are both from Pivotal and uh, we work for products called Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And uh, we provide uh, commercial products based on this CFCR open source and CFAR open source. And uh, before, uh, before we proceed to the next slide, I want to introduce ourselves and explain what we, uh, what we do in Pivotal and what we are. Uh, so my name is Sheldon Ding. Uh, I'm based at Dallas. I'm a Pivotal Cloud Foundry Principal Solutions Architect. Uh, I've already been working with uh, Pivotal for uh, five plus years. Before that, I worked for VMware. Uh, so it's always infrastructure as service, platform as service. Uh, it's been a long time. And I would like Keith to introduce himself a little bit. And I taught him how to introduce himself. Um, start. So this is going to be really bad. Let me try this, right? So, washer, jizu, ji, chisu, laizu, lua, changji. Yeah, that's not bad, right? Uh, that's OK. <laughs> yeah. So Keith is also a solutions architect of Pivotal. We are on the same team. We are basically like focusing on North America region. And uh, we basically provide operational uh, assistance uh, and guidance for uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. We deploy Cloud Foundry to uh, you know, the products on the customer side. It's more like post sales. And besides that, we also build balanced customer team. We want uh, the customer operational team to treat their uh, developers as uh, uh, customers, we, we want them to treat the platform itself as a product. And we, we, we teach them a lot like agile practice and how to build pipelines um, with uh, you know, both infrastructure, platform, and we also teach our customers uh, with uh, uh, application deployments because services, uh, you build the pipelines, you want to continue to deliver, continue to get the feedback from your customers. That's basically like what we we are doing here. Uh, any further comments here? Yeah. So the big idea that we we want to talk to you guys about today is um, basically we want developers to do what they do best, which is write application code. But what we don't want to do is sacrifice any of the security aspects. And so what we're going to show you today is how we walk through from code to commit all the way to deploying a production quality application and how we offload these things with continuous delivery pipelines, automation within a different phases of that delivery process, and uh, bring that all back together in, into uh, how you integrate this with your security policy. So, yep. Yeah, so next. Yeah, we want to talk a little bit of shift the mindset. And basically, like we want to assume the continuous threat of compromise. Traditionally, like when enterprise dealing with uh, the security attack, right, it's more like static. Like for example, they secure the parameters with a firewall and uh, inject or place some uh, you know, antivirus software into the system. But like for us, we want like borrow some concept of uh, disaster recovery. We want to treat the platform, uh, the, the security attack as a, you know, like the, it's kind of like disaster, right? So what happened when you have a disaster? You want like recovery to the previous point of the, uh, you know, either by using recovery point objective, it's basically like the time that you wish to recover to. And the other one is RPO, uh, is, is uh, how much time you take to recover that. In Pivotal Cloud Foundry, we got a product called Bosch. We, we try to convince our customers to trade the platform to be more ephemeral. And uh, we basically like a lot like even banking system, we recommend them to uh, repave the whole environment, right? Treat the VMs uh, ephemeral. And as long as they have the high availability, which our products provide, uh, we discard the VM like every 24 hours and uh, doing some rolling, uh, repaving. When we call repaving, we're repaving all the VMs within 24 hours. So assume like you got like a security attack. Someone like even inside the employee, they play some like uh, uh, 
uh, a newer vi virus or like they got like some mine in the middle of attack. They got your certificate, but because you just discard the whole VM, right? You treat everything to be ephemeral and it's repaving everything. And that's actually like just the, the minimize the security risk and the security attack. But that's the concept of repaving what we want to like keep reiterating in this uh, talk. Maybe you want to chime in a little bit more here. Sure. So the big idea here is that the hardest target to hit is a moving target, right? So the idea is if we look at a re recovery point and we set that for, let's say, every 24 hours. So we, we won't lose data any longer than 24 hours in the past. And we, it takes us, you know, say, four hours to roll out the entire environment. Then we're going to continuously do that, knowing that we have a safety net there between our objective and our time recovery. And so then what happens is a cyber attack of some sort, whether it's an advanced persistent threat or a virus, is just another disaster. And we treat it just like disaster recovery. And so this allows us to continually move that environment target to make it very, very difficult for somebody to actually attack it uh, through whatever different means that they're going to do that. Uh, yeah, so we, we definitely want to talk a, a little bit on how we're going to secure the pipeline. But before that, I want to talk what is a standard delivery pipeline. It's probably for application. Uh, so Pivotal, like we, we like to automate everything. We, we got our products called Concourse, and we're using Concourse to, uh, to build the pipeline, right? So DVCS uh, is basically distributed version system. Uh, GitHub is a standard DV, uh, DVCS, and you can have like a CVS and other, you know, uh, version uh, system. Uh, so basically like you check in the code to your DVCS, and, uh, and then you start unit testing, start building, your binaries and your containers and Docker images and then push to an artifactory or like Docker registry. Uh, and then assume you have a platform as a service here. Uh, you basically like uh, pull uh, the images or binary and deploy to um, different environments. We call this is build once and promote to different environments. Uh, this is cool, right? So you can continue this delivery as long as you check in the code. But like because we got this automation, sometimes it's like if you have like one point of a uh, you know virus, for example, a malicious code, someone checking to the GitHub because you have continuous delivery, and it can be you know up into your production environment. So how to secure your product environment is very critical here. So we're going to explain like uh, uh, some like uh, uh, prototype or principles to. Uh, Secure your pipeline and make sure you don't get like something, some malicious code into your production. So the first one is defining the supply uh, chain uh, thread. Uh, no matter whether you're using GitHub or CVS, something that something about that, they always have this uh, assigned commit uh, feature, right? Basically, like a, a developer, they have authorized keys, right? This is a kind of like authentication and authorization. And uh, GitHub definitely have this feature. You should use that, and you can rotate. And we we, we would like uh, the the developer to rotate the keys, right? So basically, like this is a standard cryptography. And developers sign the commits when they push by using their key and the, their private key. And the, when the build system pull um, the like when you are uh, clone or pulling from the from the GitHub, you're basically doing the signature verification because public was public keys uh, were pre-installed over there. And uh, uh, the same concept about another data is your uh, binaries or Docker images. You want to like assign the commits by using the build, uh, you, during the build phase and the artifactory, you, when you're pulling the data from the artifactory or Docker image, uh, you, you basically like uh, make sure the signature verification also over there. And um, again, you don't have to do that by yourself, right? So if you're ever using Docker IO and you don't use the Docker content trust, that's you are exposing yourself to some like security risk, right? Always trying to, if you're working ever for enterprise using Docker content trust. And I remember we have uh, some, you know, Harbor, Harbor is a Docker registry, you know, it's kind of like enterprise level Docker registry. It has like notary and whenever you push the Docker registry with a Docker content trust enabled and the developer will sign the image uh, with their private key and then when you pull that it has to be 
uh, a sign. If it's not a sign, then the polling will be fa it will failing, right? So this basically like defining the supply chain thread by using signature, and this is a very standard cryptography way of securing your pipeline and your data. Anything? Uh, so the primary reason why this is labeled phase one is because this is the first place in which you can start doing uh, rotation of those keys to make sure that the development force that's contributing to that code base is active. So like, you know, if you have several companies that you outsource your development to, and you as a company, as the, as the provider that's going to take those and, and put it in front of the end user, you ne don't necessarily know who's been hired, who's been fired in those different companies, right? So, you, and then if they fire somebody, but then their key or, or you're not using keys at all, then they can, and they may still have access to contribute to your code repo, which then means that they can inject that malicious code. So phase one is being able to rotate those developer credentials so that they have to check in with you on whatever that policy is. Let's say you rotate it every 30 days. That means every 30 days, you know exactly who is still hired by that particular company and who's authorized code contributors, and you can trace every line of code back into the signed commit, so you know exactly who wrote the code if there is some sort of malicious intent. So this is phase one where you can actually impact your security on, on the very initial part of that supply chain. Yeah, the other one is the limiting CI-CD breakout explorer. There are two points I want to talk about. The first one is you want to like secure data in transit, right? So we, we, we talk about like the signature on the static data, but like for the securing the data in transit, you want to enable TLS. And uh, like sometimes we also want to like using mutual TLS for the mutual trust before, between the client point and the server points. So always use TLS. Some people argue that you know, this is the internal system, but you also want to uh, avoid the man in the middle attack. And also, there may be some inside employee that can, they can do security attack on your system. So always using TLS and mutual TLS. And the other one is uh, uh, the, the, the local environment, uh, uh, the, the credentials to be a local environment, right? So limit your credential to local environments. For example, you don't want like uh, the, the, the build stage of deploy to test to have the credential overlap with the deploy to QA. I saw a lot of developers, they love to check in like, uh, you know, AWS credentials sometimes. And uh, also they are using property files rather than, uh, you know, environment variables. So always trying to limit your credentials to your local environment. That's a good practice. Anything? Yeah, so why we call this phase two is because this is the second area where you can have the big impact on your actual security. The big impact is that you have no transference. So even though Xiao Zhen or I might be able to do stuff in production, do stuff in test, and maybe we even we do code contributions, what typically happens is it, it seems like common sense, like only have the credentials for that specific environment. But what would happen is like, oh hey, it's Keith. Let's go ahead. He he should he, you know he has permission to do that stuff in production. Let's give him permissions on his account. So I sign in once, and suddenly I can access every environment. Well, if I get grumpy, that means I can affect everything all the way into production, and that's a bad practice. So the very first thing is like no transference between those properties in the environment. That's a, a one key area that you can uh, definitely lock down and keep that regulated. So that means even if I can talk somebody into give me a credential that's on the build team, or talk somebody into give me a credential at test, I still can't get to production. You, you see, so that, that I'm very limited in what I can actually do. And then the second thing is. Uh, using TLS in transit, you're going to rotate those those certificates out, right? So those things will always be, be active, but you also can IP whitelist between those uh, particular environments so that you only have point-to-point -point, uh, actual authorization to actually get into that environment through another specific environment. And so this also limits your breakout potential in this particular thing. So this is why we call it phase two of, of, of impact on your security. Yeah, the other thing is about the application or data integrity. Again, this is built into uh, GitHub or Docker registry. And basically, like uh, the GitHub, when you push the code, if you compare the hash upon like uh, what kind of like files you have, and when you pull the data, it's uh, it's going to compare the hash again and then do some verification. This will guarantee you that you know if someone plays some malicious code and the integrity will be there. Along with the like, signature verification, we can have a strong uh, application integrity. Yes. Oh yeah, this is, this is really good because this is, what we're, this is the heart of what we want to talk about today, which is the application code as the unit of currency that moves through the entire system. This is what we're going to 
uh, both secure up to this point, but also as we bolt on other things, make it a consistent experience across that application's evolution. And what that means is that my coder doesn't have to know anything about security downstream. They don't have to know anything about what it looks like in production and what they need to do. They don't need to know about you know, how to configure middleware services or databases. All that stuff is, we're about to show you how that stuff is handed to them. But what we're doing is we're now taking delivery of the code that they've committed into our particular environment and gonna move and graduate it up into production. And so looking at that unit of currency, go to the next slide. Um, that, that's what we want to talk about is the, the steps. So these are very generic steps, right? These are everything that happens uh, to be able to put that level of maturity around application code. So we start with code that's built, tested, and security scans. We already, we already know that the code is safe at this point in time, but we need a lot of other things to it that, that actually make it uh, viable. And so some of those things are first, you know, we're talking about cloud scale. So we need to know what are the available hosts. So workload capacity, how do we balance this across all of our other tenants on that particular piece or within our company, all the other application workloads that are on there. So we look for available host. We uh, configure on top of a hardened container. So what the hardened container, we'll, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but really what it is, is it's a stripped down operating system that is, is only there that has just the necess necessary libraries in order to run the container itself. So this means that its actual attack a threat surface is very, very small as well compared to a, a full-blown operating system. We might only have 35 to 40 system libraries in there that could be exposed, and they're very easy to monitor and fix and update with CVEs and patching. And we want to grab all the backing services. So like I said, we don't want them to worry about how to configure the database, how to cluster the database, do these type of things. We just need to know that they need a database to use, so we're going to inject the environment variables and the, and the connection logic into the actual application automatically for them. We're gonna pull that application source code, we're gonna create the package, we're gonna configure the dependent service, and then we're gonna schedule that at that container to start. And then what we gotta do is start looking at the production quality stuff. So we need to know, like, if we wanna run in a high availability configuration, well, we need to consider things as a platform. Uh, we need to consider things like, what if an entire availability goes down? What if an entire region goes down? So we need to scale up a number of instances across different availability zones and different regions so that we can survive an entire region going down. So we're gonna handle that for them automatically. We're gonna look at setting the route, the SSL termination, the configuration, the load balancer, all of this stuff, if you think about it, this is applied against every single application that goes out there. So we have a consistent, like we don't forget to do a route or we don't forget to set the firewall against it. We don't forget to do the SSL termination. This is all done automated for us. And the developer doesn't know anything about that. So they don't have to concern themselves with how does SSL termination work? How does the load balancer work? We take all that stuff away from them and make this all the way automated until we get the app into production. Now these same steps are applied whether it's the Cloud Foundry application runtime or the Kubernetes portion of this. Uh, Kubernetes is, we're still catching up to some of this automation stuff, but we hope by the end of next year, we should be able to accomplish all these 16 steps in either, in either particular offering, whether in a, it's application runtime or, or container runtime uh, services. Yeah, I just want to see, like, we already achieved this uh, uh, with the CFAR, right? Basic Cloud Foundry distribution. And we are working a lot on the on-premise uh, distribution of a PKS, which is a Kubernetes version, right? If you ever work with the VMware, we, we partner with the VMware on uh, SXT, basically, like, it provides a lot of container to container networking, network policy, and uh, also distribute the firewall. And we are trying to like uh, add like more and more features in the in the automation way to uh, sec to create a secure pipeline to make sure we deliver uh, you know the security features on the platform as service of on the fly. So as you look, we we basically packaged everything we needed to get the application to production. So now we're in the runtime uh, portion of this. So this is phase four. This is how do we impact the runtime and. Uh, just Quick shout out, Matt Seth is a platform architect for us. I borrowed these, this uh, diagram from him because it was very useful to talk about some of these things. But if you look at this, so this is you know, a notional of a container running there. And inside this container, we have things like user namespace, mount namespace. And what these do is allow us to restrict user scope so that even if you compromise one of the users within the container, you're very limited in what you can actually do. That user only has a very few permissions that it, that it can actually execute against. We also do file system isolation in there so that you can't impact other aspects of the file system. And then of course, it runs on top of the hardened uh, container image, which is what we were talking about before. So we have both the stem cell, which is the VM level operating system that's been stripped down to just run containers. 
And then we have the container root file system, and there, we do a, like an overlay on top of that, which means that the application itself, the binaries, are in a very small read-write layer. They have very little impact. If you break out, you really can't go anywhere. There's, there's nothing that it can actually do because of the way we've restricted where it, it, it runs. We've provided everything to it to run, and so therefore it itself cannot actually go, go and do anything outside of that, that particular piece. Talking about, talking about yeah, like I just want to talk a little bit on the stem cell, right? So the way PCI works with the stem cell is uh, we, we treat the stem cell as a VM template, right? We have a security hardening pipeline. It's running every day. It's, if there's a CVE comes in and this pipeline will just uh, apply the patch and it's generate the stem cell, the VM templates for each uh, infrastructure as service, AWS, uh, GCP, or vSphere. And this kind of like stem cell actually applies to both uh, Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry distribution. And the, the only thing is like we, for Cloud Foundry, we have this root file system. But since, since uh, you can have this, uh, uh, what I call the, the Docker, right? So you can pull the Docker image. It's not like a, as hardened as Cloud Foundry. You have to use the, just one way of root file system. That's why you, ha you have to make sure you secure the Docker registry in the future. And we have this enterprise level harbor is very important as a commercial offering. Mm -hmm. And if we go to the, the next slide, so continu oh, yeah, continuing on, uh, we look at network namespace, and this is how we do network isolation with port virtualization. So the reason I'm, I'm showing you all these different pieces of this is because these are all the things that, has, so the Cloud Foundry application runtime is a little bit more mature than the container runtime, but we're working to make the same level of parity inside of Kubernetes so that you have the same level of security within the actual container itself. And then rootless containers. Uh, obviously, you know, any time that you have a bridge between your root VM and your container VM and in the, any of those accounts, you have a problem because you can escalate privileges. You can break into the actual root VM and, and ele elevate those privileges and do some more malicious stuff. So with rootless containers, what this means is that there's no concept of mapping between a user in the container and a user on the VM, which means there's no way to break into the VM and elevate those privileges. So these are also concepts that we have to think about as we move into the Kubernetes world and how we're going to productize these types of things for, for the same level of enterprise level maturity. And then AppArt, Armor, and SecComp restrict those untrusted processes and system call filtering so that even if you spawn, even, even if you got out somehow and you wanted to spawn a process to do something nasty to the, to the environment, you're going to be blocked by the actual app armor piece, uh, which will prevent you from uh, doing untrusted processes in the container itself. So this is really important. These, all these concepts are applicable, whether it's the CFAR or the CFCR, and so this is, this is how making sure in the runtime that we're still maintaining that level of security once our users start interacting with these applications. And then we talked about this a little bit, which is the continuous uh, zero down CVE patching. Because of these contracts, what we're really trying to get to is this particular model. This allows us to swap out vulnerabilities. If we discover a vulnerability like a virus itself or some sort of malicious piece, we're able to rotate out that stem cell without impacting any of the actual user base. Right? So as we do this canary style de deploy, we can actually move the user uh, access to a different, a different VM, rotate out the stem cell, rotate out the runtime, rotate out the root file system, and then all these are patched, move the workloads back over to the left side, and then do the same thing. And then we just keep doing that until we actually get across the entire enterprise. And so again, your user experience doesn't go down, but then you're also still focused, very focused on the security aspects of, of that stem cell and of the root file system itself. And so this same concept is exactly what we're doing in, on the PKS side, which is the Kubernetes offering, which is looking at those root file systems and how are we going to rotate that out from, from the actual Docker, Docker registry. The next part of this is the, uh, the continuous threat is advanced persistent threat. So what an advanced persistent threat is, it's the type of code that gets into your system, doesn't act right away. It sits there for a while and it learns about your system. And as it gathers more and more information about your system, then it gets ready to do an attack. It says, I've now discovered the IPs, I've now discovered the types of file systems uh, or operating systems, I've now discovered all these different things and now I'm going to launch an attack. So how we get rid of this is we assume a zero trust network, right? And this is what you want to look at is, all your components that make up your distributed operating system, whether, which, whether it's a platform as a service, whether it's your own distributed uh, offering, what you're doing, is through mutual TLS between the components, we ensure that you know, you're stuck on one side or the other. We rotate out those credentials. We can repave every system component in there, and then so even if that persistent thread is in there, it's got a very small time frame in which it can learn what, how to attack your system, and then suddenly we wipe it off the map, and then we create a, a brand new instance of that. And so you have to start your attack all back over again to get back in there to, to do something bad. 
And so, like Chajin said earlier, if we're setting this for a 24-hour period, that means you have less than a day to get in, learn about the system, launch an attack uh, to some other system component. Even if you did, you're going to be uh, stopped by the TLS, com uh, TLS aspect of that. And even if you did that, 24 in 24 hours, you're going to be wiped off and have to start again. And so this is phase five. This is when you're bringing everything together. You're repaving your entire stuff. You're rotating all your credentials out. You're updating all your, your certificates so that they're new and current. You're, you're getting rid of any disgruntled users that happen to still be in the system because you've rotated those things out. And you brought it all together into like a final vision of how to continuously move this target for attackers to try to hit. And here's the zero dust model, rotating all those system credentials. Yeah, you just jump one slide ahead. Yeah, I just kind of combine them all. And then finally, if you look at what this looks like, so for us, this is what we do. So, you know, Bosch is how we actually manage all these things in a consistent fashion. So whether it's Bosch or it's some other release management, that's, you know, totally up to you guys. But what it does is, if you, you can see, you know, you combine NSXT with like the software-defined networking piece that does a container-level security, perimeter security. Then inside each of these big boxes, you did the component level credential rotation and the repaving of those platforms, and then you can uh, and then you can continuously update the, the vulnerabilities uh, through the actual virus piece. And so all these things give your platform operations team a single user experience on how to actually uh, manage this thing from a security aspect. And it gives you a consistent security model across any of the type of workloads that you're dealing with, uh, including the, uh, the networking piece as well. So it, it's pretty much, you know, you've thought from the beginning from your developers all the way through to production and how you're going to manage that in, in terms of the runtime. Let me go to the last slide. And so to bring this all together, phase one, you know, the thing you can start with is aggressive rotation of those developer uh, credentials or developer keys. Phase two is rotation of the environment credentials, uh, endpoint IPs and dynamic management of those endpoints. So this is your, in, your TLS in transit, IP whitelisting from point one to point two, and then rotating that cert so those are always consistent are always current. And then phase three is the continuous verification of the application integrity. So this means that even if somebody attacked me in the middle of that process, like post build, but pre-deployment in operations, I would immediately see the hash inconsistencies and I would know the application was tampered with. And then once I get into runtime is at making sure that it's only something that's authorized to run in there. And if it ever broke out, restricting its movement so that it can't go anywhere else. And so that's uh, phase four. And then phase five is bringing that all together and doing all the different pieces, including le least uh, privilege on the container uh, and renewal of those authorizing credentials. So all these brought together, you really think through from your initial developer commit all the way into your uh, post application in, in deployment and then how you're gonna continue and manage those workloads. And I think that's it. You guys have any questions? Uh -oh. Quiet, that's not good. Sure. Developer signing, signing of commits. Yeah, it's very straightforward. Actually, GitHub has that feature, doesn't it? Yeah, I think you're t uh, talking about the image signing, right? So there's a there's a framework called TUF, right? It's a TUF, it's updated framework, which is uh, is is already being adopted in the Docker world. So like Docker.io or uh, the other one is called Harbor. I think you know other vendors they have Docker registry provide that feature. As long as you enable Docker Content Trust, right? If you Google Docker Content Trust, uh, probably you cannot Google here. Just by do Docker Content Trust, and uh, it, you know, once you enable that, you start to pull, uh, push the image. It's automatically like, signing the image and using this update framework. The other ter the other terminology is called notary service. Notary service is kind of like an implementation of TAF. And uh, yeah, to answer your question directly, like this is already built into Docker.io or like uh, you know commercial uh, Docker registry like as Harbor. It's, it's very transparent to developers. Yeah, your biggest level of effort in that is managing the actual keys themselves. So you're going to have to create some sort of internal company process that does it on a uh, on a cycle. Like hey, every 30 days we generate these keys and then we hand these things out. How do we make sure that these things are, are done? Or if you're doing it within the image signing, it's how are we going to actually manage those? What kind of cadence are you gonna manage those keys on? But the actual how it works is very, very straightforward because it's built into a lot of the technologies today. Uh, it's just more the difficulty is getting your company to enforce that policy uh, so that it is uh, actually done on a regular basis. Any other questions? Yes.
So, so it, Keith, I, maybe you want to repeat okay. the question. Sure. So, so what he was asking is, so all of these things are necessary. Like, if you think about it from a holistic. But which things could you implement first as a low-hanging fruit? And some of these things are, so some of them are dependent on the type of company that you are, right? So whether or not you rotate your developer keys is dependent, if your developers are in-house, it's maybe not as necessary, right? Because you'll know when you hire or fire somebody, if they leave or just become disgruntled, whatever. You still want to protect against it because the disgruntled employee you may never know, right? Until post-attack. But in general, that's not what happens, right? So if you're a company that has everything in source, maybe you want to focus on something else. Now, rotation of, of credentials or certificates can be very difficult. It depends on the type of technology that you're using, right? So, you know, it's hard for us to sit up here and not be biased, right? So, because we work for Pivotal, right? So, Cloud Foundry has this stuff built in, but other technologies do as well. So, if your technology already has it, then I would make sure that you're taking advantage of a technology that already has that. If it does not, then things like, uh, you know, how you're managing your containers and runtime is probably the most critical, right? Because this is your, if you think about it from a user perspective, where does your user give you personal information through your application? Where does your, where, where is the most exposure to the outside world through the runtime in the application? Where is it that most likely folks are going to attack? Your production environment. So you really want to start with your production environment and making that secure. And then work your way back into the less threat models. You always look at it from the threat. Where's the greatest threat? The greatest threat is wherever it touches the internet and the most people have access to it, right? That is most likely where your threat is going to come in. And to the edge cases, which are like insider threat, those, are, those tend to be edge cases that don't happen as frequently. So you always want to approach it in like a de-escalating sort of thing. Most, most important or most likely to least likely. And so I would really focus on your actual runtime. It would be the first thing that I would try to try to work out how your runtime works. Okay. Yep, no problem. Any other questions? Come on, don't be shy. I mean, you heard my manner, and it was terrible. So I mean, no, nobody's going to speak. Nobody's going to do worse than I did. Any other questions? Say it one more time. He was uh, so. <laughs> repeat the question. He was asking the demo, uh, you know, for this security type. Of, yeah. Oh no, we don't have a demo. Yeah. There's no demo. Like we ha we do this all the time with our customers, but we don't we don't have a demo. Yeah, yeah because right. it's a uh, 35 minutes uh, presentation. Right, because the time wise, we don't have we don't have like right now we're out of time. Yeah. Yeah, we have lots of repos that this is built in that you can go check out for sure. Um, if you go on, uh, let's see, what would be a public one? Um, we can get it to you. Just uh, email us, uh, like on the presentation, you can see our emails. Just email us and we'll, we'll shoot you a repo that you can see all the stuff in action. Yep. Okay. Right. So both. So what this is, is this is born out of, so Shajin and I have been doing this for a long time with a lot of uh, Fortune 100 companies. And so this is born out of our experience when working with those. So some of these things like, if you look at uh, phase four, like yes, Cloud Foundry already does that. But this isn't a Cloud Foundry talk. This is, a, this is the type of thing that you have to do some way if you choose a technology like, say, Cloud Foundry, where it's already done, that's great. But if you want to do it yourself, that's fine. But you need to think about this, this kind of thing. But you know, we come in and we do a lot of these things with our customers uh, as uh, an additional value that we provide to them because of our experience with all these co companies and understanding. So yeah, this isn't like a must-have. This is more like experiential, like what we've done in the past that has worked out really well. Uh, like their security teams look at this and they say, ah, that makes sense. This is what we want, you know, and this is how we do it. So. That, that's what this is born out of. Just to kind of give you guys ideas of the things that you have to think about from a threat perspective for, for each of your uh, particular companies. Any other questions? Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for, uh, for coming.